Uh, hi everyone and welcome to this third season of What's Your Poison uh, seminar series organised by the HERA Research Project Intoxicating Spaces and we're kicking things off with spices. Uh, that's not spice, the sort of the legal manufactured high, um, but actual spices uh, and we're thrilled to welcome as our first speaker uh, Gitan Professor Gitanjali Shahani. Uh, Professor Shahani is currently Chair of the Department of English Language and Literature at San Francisco State University. Her research interests range widely across Shakespeare studies, post-colonial studies, film studies and food studies. Uh, amongst other things, she's the author of the wonderful monograph, Tasting Difference, Food, Race and Cultural Encounters in Early Modern Literature, which came out with Cornell University Press in 2020. And it's a brilliant study and do get a hold of it if you haven't uh, already. Uh, and before we get underway, our usual spot of housekeeping. Uh, as ever, Gitanjali will speak for around half an hour, and then there'll be about half an hour uh, for questions and discussion afterwards. Uh, there is a little chat feature on the bottom right, say something nice, uh, where you're very welcome uh, to post comments and observations throughout the talk. Um, however, if you have a question for Gitanjali, uh, please post it using the separate ask a question button. Uh, and you can sort of pop these in as they occur to you throughout the talk, um, or you can save them up until the Q&A at the end. Uh, so without further ado, it gives me huge pleasure to turn things over to Gitanjali and the hot stuff, early modern trafficking in spices. So Gitanjali, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, James. Thank you for that generous introduction and for all your work in organizing this talk. Uh, thank you to everyone in the audience uh, for joining us here today. I'm looking forward to your questions and I'll be trying to glance at the chat whenever possible. Uh, I'm going to start here with a quote from Salman Rushdie's The Moor's Last Sigh, in which the eponymous Moor, in speaking of his lineage, also happens to speak most profoundly and most irreverently on the history of the spice trade. And I quote from him. From the beginning, what the world wanted from Bloody Mother India was daylight clear. They came for the hot stuff, just like any man calling on a tart." End quote. The hot stuff is indeed an essential ingredient in Salman Rushdie's epic saga of the Indies. For it is pepper, the pungent black gold of the Malabar coast, that brings together the many fantastic strands of his narrative. As the Moor puts it, if it had not been for peppercorns, then what is ending now in East and West might never have begun. What is true of his story is true of history itself. It was for Pepper that Vasco da Gama's ship set sail from Lisbon's Tower of Belém to the Malabar coast of the Indian subcontinent. And likewise, it was for aromatic spices that the Dutch, the French, and the English ventured east, following in the wake of the first arrived Portuguese. They all came in pursuit of the hot stuff, and their prolonged intercourse with the Indies would irrevocably change the course of world history. The intricate trajectories of these spices are the subject of my talk here today. I explore here a particular set of responses to the early modern spice trade, a conflicted discourse of fear and desire that attached itself to commodities like pepper, nutmeg, mace, and cloves as they infiltrated the English marketplace via the newly formed East India Company. Like Rushdie's account, mine is concerned with the ways in which their scents and flavors traveled across oceans and permeated everyday lives. I look to such genres as the early modern recipe collection and household companion in order to unearth some of the rare secrets and delights hidden therein. In their spice-laden mixtures, we can trace the nascent origins of what would be a monumental cultural encounter between two worlds. In what follows, I look at a particular historical moment in this long culinary history during which the taste of spices came to be associated with the taste of difference. By this, I mean that the experience of tasting these ingredients was also an experience of imagining the racial and cultural others associated with their production and cultivation. In imaginative renderings of the spice trade, they were incarnated as Indian boys and Indian queens, as blackamoors and bantamen, terms frequently used for the inhabitants of the Indies and the Spice Islands. They lapsed insatiable appetite as well as aversion, both of which were expressed in specifically racialist terms. My narrative shifts from the inventive spaces of the early modern English kitchen to the fairy bowers of the Shakespearean stage to the urban streets of London. In the first section, I look at the domestic literature on the incorporation of spices into English cuisine, where I trace a gendered controversy over the ingestion of seemingly dangerous exotic ingredients. 
In the second, I turn to the spiced Indian air of Shakespeare's fairy world in A Midsummer Night's Dream, in which I examine the conflict between Oberon and Titania in terms of this larger gendered conflict about the appropriate domestic consumption of foreign merchandise. In the third, I offer an example of an imagined resolution to these controversies in Thomas Middleton's Triumph of Honor and Virtue, in which an Indian queen assuages anxieties about the taste of difference through her conversion narrative. Performed in the streets of London, Middleton's mask offers us an opportunity to explore the legitimization of spices in urban spaces, necessitated by their fraud presence in domestic spaces. Each section dwells on a particular embodied incarnation of Indian spices. In the first, we have a specter of a monster by the imagination of domestic writers who rule the English housewife's mixing of Indian spices with English ingredients, the very cause of such monstrosities in their opinion. In the second, we have an imaginative rendering of these same gendered anxieties in the figure of the Indian boy, the contentious object of Oberon and Titania's discord in fairyland. In the final glimpse, we have a black Indian queen who dispels all the above anxieties by mitigating her threatening otherness and affirming her willing submission to English values. Performed in the streets of London as part of the annual Lord Mayor's pageant, Middleton's triumph brings spices into the streets, very literally showering them into the gathered crowds. While these spices were not quite intoxicants in the way that we think of addictive substances like coffee or even the far more salubrious potion that is tea, the transformations they are perceived to effect on the body are no less significant than what we traditionally understand as stimulants. Whether in the kitchen or in Shakespeare's green world or in the urban setting of Middleton's pageant, each incarnation of spices I discuss here speaks to consistent desires and anxieties associated with spices as commodities that were simultaneously strange and familiar, potentially healing and poisonous. The first example I will consider here is from Timothy Bright in a tract first published in the 1580s. And I quote here from Bright, Nay, which is yet more absurd that the health of so many Christian nations should hang upon the courtesy of the heathen and barbarous nations to whom nothing is more odious than the very name of Christianity, end quote. The 16th century physician was one among the many critics of the newfangled English reliance on Indian spices like cinnamon, cloves, nutmeg, to cure numerous bodily ailments. Bright decried the unlearned merchants who jeopardized the English constitution by bringing these strange drugs into the local marketplace solely to reap gain. Extolers of native ingredients like rosemary, basil, sage, and thyme, he pleaded with his countrymen to look to their own fields and leave the banks of the Nile and the fens of India alone. After all, unlike Indians and Egyptians, the English had not taken to eating lizards, dragons, and crocodiles. Why then did they eagerly consume the outlandish medicines of these strangers, the physician wondered. For Bright, Indian spices were fundamentally incommensurate with the English physiognomy. Imported from dangerous heathen lands, they would not only destroy what Bright called our English bodies, but also our custom of life, he asserted. Bright was not alone in fearing the long-term repercussions of this foreign merchandise. In several contemporary tracts and treatises, Critics expressed apprehensions about how the English humoral makeup would withstand these alien entities. Would English men and women morph into what they called blackamoors, like the barbarous inhabitants of the strange nations from whence these spices came, reared on a precariously heterogeneous diet of foreign and domestic ingredients? Would English children grow into hybrid monstrosities? Would these costly luxuries eventually replace the simples and herbs of the quintessential English kitchen garden? How would they fare in the hands of the English housewife, the chief agent through whom culinary, medicinal, and pharmacological concoctions were made available to men, children, and attendants in the early modern household? In particular, it was the potent role these spices played in women's kitchen physic that troubled a number of authors. Stirred into cordials, sprinkled into pies, or distilled into perfumes, these commodities could unobtrusively enter the highly permeable orifices of the English body. One of the earliest domestic manuals that explicitly yokes the English housewife's moral character to her abstinence from spices was entitled The English Housewife, a text by Gervais Markham, 
the writer of compendious domestic manuals in the early 17th century. Published in 1615, the English housewife begins with a list of inward virtues of the mind, which ought to be in every housewife. The list includes dictates such as a housewife must be religious, uh, she must have temp she must be temperate, the usual stuff. Her garments must be altogether without toyish garishness. Like several early modern conduct manuals, Markham's is also intent on regulating female speech. The good housewife must refrain from uncomely language, we are told. But as Markham proceeds, we find that he is as concerned with what goes into the housewife's mouth as he is with what comes out of it. Among the chief prescriptions laid down for the housewife is one on her diet, specifying that it must proceed from the provision of her own yard than the furniture of the markets. Markham's vision of the ideal English housewife is contingent upon her use of unpretentious domestic fare rather than outlandish foreign wear. Yet paradoxically, as Markham proceeds further with his guidebook, he violates his own stipulations, compiling over a hundred recipes that would require the English housewife to use one or the other variety of exotic spice. His concoctions are literally peppered with rare and costly ingredients, all of which would necessarily have come from the Indies rather than the housewife's own yard. He recommends inhaling a fine powder made of nutmeg, cinnamon, cloves, and mace to be taken when the passion of the mother cometh. He suggests a pepper snuff for stinking nostrils and quartered nutmegs for the wind colic. Likewise, his recipes, whether for pudding pie, gingerbread, or jelly, are all strewn with an assorted mix of pepper, cinnamon, nutmeg, mace, and ginger. This blatant contradiction in the English housewife has elicited comment from several critics who wonder at Markham's willingness to incorporate foreign spices into his culinary repertoire, despite his fetishization of indigenous ingredients. Did Markham simply forget to practice what he preached? Critics like Kim Hall are inclined to think now. In a persuasive reading of The English Housewife, she argues that it might be that the woman's familiar acquaintance is the very thing necessary to remove the threat of strangeness as substances pass through the English home and are transformed from raw material to food, they lose their foreign taint. Viewed as such, Markham's English housewife is bestowed with the power to render strange commodities familiar. It is she rather than the merchant who can somehow English foreign ingredients through her daily rituals and routines. Unlike Markham, however, later 17th century authors like Thomas Tryon were less convinced about the English housewife's ability to domesticate these alien entities. Tryon, who wrote after the Civil War and the growing transatlantic slave trade, was among those who publicly rebuked the housewife for the sheer indiscretion with which she consumed all sorts of spices from the Indies. In The Good Housewife Made a Doctor, Tryon was especially concerned with the female proclivity to mix all sorts of Indian spices into what he called our domestic productions. He attributed this pernicious habit to the essentially appetitive nature of the English housewife, her irrepressible covetousness of foreign novelties and her irresponsible fusion of these into daily preparations were sure to endanger the English constitution. After all, what agreement or affinity could there be between English fruits, grains, herbs, and seeds and those that came from the Indies, he demanded. And this is his own answer to his own question. Not so much as between the complexion of a fat-nosed, lubber-lipped blackamoor or swarthy bantaman with a head like a sugar loaf and our most florid beauties, Tryon offered by way of reply to his own question. By mixing English staples with the produce of what these blackamoors and bantamans, uh, bantaman by which Tryon means the Japanese islanders, the English housewife was in essence committing a grossly unnatural act. Tryon proceeds to elaborate on this point in more explicitly visual terms by invoking an image of the monstrous creature that could grow from such heterogeneous mixing. And I quote from him, what likeness or correspondence is there between cloves, mace, nutmeg, cinnamon, and ginger, and apples, milk, butter, herbs, or flesh? Verily, there is no simile between them and the foolish painter that to a man's head added a stag's neck and a fish's body did not limb a more deformed monster than those that prepare a monstrous unwholesome diet for either the well or sick who jumble together ingredients so heterogeneous and as it were, so diametrically opposite." End quote. 
Trotman's repeated emphasis on what he calls affinity, agreement, likeness, or correspondence is telling. It bespeaks a distinct obsession with homogeneity and sameness. When English humoral boundaries are penetrated, as it were, with foreign foods, the English physiognomy itself stands the risk of mutating into a deformed hybrid. Thus it is that Tryon's culminating image, a figure with a man's head, a stag's neck, and a fish's body, is the very antithesis of likeness or correspondence. Part beast, part man, it is an incarnation of the grotesque incongruities that result when opposites mix. Drawn from Horace's Ars Poetica, as many of you may have guessed, uh, this creature embodies a literally monstrous cross-species. Its deformity hints at other kinds of deformities that could take shape when what he calls swarthy bantamen and fat-nosed lubberlip blackamoors come into contact with England's florid beauties. In its crossbred nature, it conjures up dangerous visions of the monstrosity that could be born of England's long-term intercourse with the Indies. Most importantly, in the context of spices, Tryon holds the English housewife culpable for creating such a monster. Unlike Markham's housewife in the early part of the century, who successfully transforms dangerous foreign ingredients into innocuous ingredients, Tryon's housewife in the later 17th century greedily consumes them, rendering them even more strange and monstrous in the process. Perhaps by the time Tryon was writing, the practices that Markham had singled out became more entrenched in the household. Despite the different approaches, however, both Tryon and Markham positioned the English housewife as a figure responsible for protecting the boundaries of the body politic. Where Markham's housewife guards a distinct English cultural identity, Tryon's housewife guards, albeit ineffectually, a form of English physiological purity. She's pivotal to their respective fantasies of an isolated, insulated domestic realm that must remain unchanged by England's cultural and mercantile encounters across the globe. If the vast majority of early modern cookbooks throughout the century are anything to go by, however, Markham's and Tryon's nativist fantasies were at a far remove from the lived reality of women's lives. Frequently written by women, circulating in print and manuscripts, Form. These were the 18th century. A certain Mistress Sarah Long's handwritten recipe book is true with many references to spices. She sprinkles mace in her gooseberry fool, an ounce of nutmeg in her rice pudding, and pepper in a receipt to aid women such as are subject to miscarry. Like Long, other 17th century women relied on Indian spices for the most intimate bodily practices. One manual from the 1650s suggests that they use pepper in the natural place after they had known a man carnally in order to hinder conception. Another recipe from Hannah Woolley's widely read The Accomplished Lady's Delight notes the use of pepper to provoke terms or bring on the menstrual cycle. And I think there is some speculation that these might be abortion recipes as well in which spices were used. Spices could also be put to cosmetic uses as Woolley made sure to include them in a potion that promised to make the hair fair, in a sweet water for the hands, and in what she called the queen's perfume, the last of which required no less than 30 cloves. Woolley's recipes for pies, sugar cakes, and cheesecakes indicate that women use spices in ways that are easily recognizable to us today. Occasionally, though, we come across a concoction that attributes almost quasi-magical qualities to spices. A remedial water in Woolley's manual, for instance, requires ingredients that range from 30 peppercorns to a man-child's urine, purportedly to cure blindness. And this is the title of the recipe. A water for the eyes to make a man see in 40 days who have been blind seven years before if he be under the age of 50. And these are the instructions that follow. Take fennel rue, sage of each a quarter, wash them clean and stamp them. Do them in a fair mashing pan. Put thereto the powder of 30 peppercorns, six spoonfuls of live honey, and 10 spoonfuls of the urine of a man child that is wholesome. Mingle them well together and boil them till they be half wasted. Then take it down and strain it. Put thereof with a feather into the eyes of the blind and let the patient use this medicine at night when he goeth to bed, and within 40 days he shall see. It is good for all manner of sore eyes." End quote. I don't recommend you try this one at home. 
While we might be dubious about the efficacy of a potion that promises to cure blindness by applying a mix of pepper and urine on the eyes, uh, its value to modern readers lies in the glimpse it offers us of the many transformative properties attributed to spices. Mixing together diverse ingredients, the English housewife sought to heal, transform, and control the body in ways that seem both strange and familiar to us. She administered clyster pipes, supervised purges, and worked with items as varied as pepper, urine, blood milk, uh, blood, breast milk, human bones, and umbilical cords. If a woman was to perform these roles effectively, according to Willie, she had to be well acquainted with a range of herbs and spices. Thus it is that the gentlewoman's companion, Willie lays out a detailed taxonomy of ingredients like pepper, cloves, nutmeg, mace, and cinnamon. She concedes that the English woman is likely to have in her own yard such aromatic spices as rosemary, lavender, thyme, or sage that need no introduction or explanation. The great plenty we have of these excellent plants, she observes, have many judicious persons admire that being supplied at home with such admirable simples, we should hunt so eagerly after outlandish spices. But Willie herself seems non-committal non about the opinion of these judicious persons. She does not at any point in the manual suggest that her female readers should refrain from using these so-called outlandish ingredients. She does, however, attribute their shortcomings to the carelessness of the merchant, complaining that they are frequently imported rotten or worm-eaten so long before they come into our hands that they have lost half their virtue. It appears then that Willie is cognizant of the debate surrounding the English housewife's habitual use of Indian spices, but is not as concerned about the mixing of strange and familiar ingredients. Taken together, these domestic manuals present competing visions of the English woman and her domestic domain. Where Markham and Tryon, as writers of domestic manuals at different points in the century, seek to recuperate the household from a colonial or market economy, Woolley, as a writer of receipt books, fashions a household that is enmeshed in it. Her queen-like closet is well stocked with a range of commodities from the marketplace, available via newly formed circuits of commerce and exchange. Collectively, these domestic manuals present us with a range of everyday scenarios in which the English women, in, in which English women work closely with Indian spices. In this next section, I turn to the more fantastic representations of Indian merchandise that appear in the dramatic literature of the late 16th and early 17th centuries. Focusing first on Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, I analyze the incarnate forms that spices take on in the early modern imagination. Now, the playful subplot of A Midsummer Night's Dream might seem like an unlikely starting point for a discussion of colonial plunder. And yet, as critics have demonstrated, Shakespeare's fairy society is not as far removed from the world of things as it may seem. In a compelling essay on the politics of fairy lore in early modern English literature, Marjorie Swan elaborates on the significance of fairy literature in Tudor and Stuart literature, emphasizing its importance as a new form of material display grounded in a nascent capitalism. She traces the shift in fairy law from its roots in residual folk culture to its participation in new rituals of socioeconomic exchange, a shift that parallels England's transition from a rural household-based economy to an emerging mercantile entity. Shakespeare's fairy world in A Midsummer Night's Dream both registers and affects this paradigm shift. The merry sprites in Oberon and Titania's train are depicted as willing, if somewhat mischievous participants in a rustic agrarian economy. Robin Goodfellow is known to playfully frighten the maidens of the villagery, skim the milk, and sometimes labor in the garden. He teases gossips, yet readily takes on their household tasks, while they affectionately call out for sweet buck. Like the diminutive creatures in Titania's retinue who make coats out of bat's wings and fashion candles from waxen thighs of bumblebees, Robin Goodfellow contributes to an indigenous domestic economy. At the same time, Swan argues, Shakespeare subtly connects the fairies with a world of commerce and material display far removed from an agrarian household economy. It is not without significance, for instance, that Oberon and Titania's conflict is centered on an Indian changeling. The language of their quarrel is suffused with the image of trade, mercantile ventures, and Eastern riches. While they're as preoccupied with domestic order as their traditional English fairies, they're much more invested in the world of commerce and exchange than their traditional counterparts. The play thus 
Thomas invokes England's pre-capitalist folkloric past only to imbricate it in England's proto-colonial mercantile present. Significantly, India becomes a key site for the enactment of these tensions. On the one hand, the play invokes India in conjunction with the imaginative spaces of fairyland. On the other, it configures India in more geographically precise terms, yoking it with actual mercantile expeditions to the east. It conjures up a mythical past in which the king of fairies hails from the furthest step of India, and the queen of fairies spends many a night gossiping with her votress along the Indian shore. Simultaneously, it points to a mercantile present in which this Indian shore is dotted with trading vessels in search of spices and other Eastern wares. To use the language of the play itself, one might say it depicts India as a kind of airy nothing, even as it gives to India a local habitation and a name. In its part mythical, part mercantile setting, we can see the workings of a peculiarly gendered struggle over the acquisition and consumption of colonial merchandise from the Indies. Early historicist scholarship has been especially cognizant of this Indian subtext in the dream playtext. Critics have drawn attention to the invisible yet at present Indian boy in the dream, the root cause of all discord in fairyland, the absent center of the play. The distinctly Indian genealogy of the otherwise nameless changeling and his central role in the play's economies of exchange have led these critics to a broader discussion of the ways in which the dream text participates in early modern racial, imperial, and mercantilist discourses on the Indies. My own interest in this absent present figure is specifically tied to Titania's interest in him. Her obsession with him might be contextualized in terms of the growing female fascination with Indian novelties that had been incorporated into the domestic rhythms of the early modern household. Her appetite for the exotic and the ensuing disorder in the natural world can be read in terms of emerging debates about regarding the English woman's supposedly insatiable appetite for Indian commodities that had similarly impacted the local economy. For instance, her very first mention of the changeling is in conjunction with the trifles she consumes by his mother's side, marking the embarked traders on the flood. In her fertile vision, the Indian mother's womb is rich with the young squire in much the same way that the big belly trading ships are brimming with Indian merchandise. Literally and metaphorically overladen with riches, both vessels contain a promise of the East. In essence, the Indian boy is analogous to the exotic merchandise plundered from the Indian shore. He is an incarnation of the other tokens and trifles from the spiced Indian air that his mother so willingly presents to Tanya and she so eagerly accepts. The female bond requires no intermediaries or agents of exchange. In fact, men appear to be altogether redundant in this vision of intercourse with the Indies. India benignly offers up her riches, thereby precluding the possibility of ravishment and colonial plunder at the hands of conquistadors and merchants. Interestingly, while critics have made a persuasive case for the maternal nature of Titania's claims over the Indian boy, they have frequently elided the mercantile nature of these claims. In shaping fantasies, figurations of gender and power in Elizabethan culture, for instance, Louise Montrose contends that Titania's bond with her votress is rooted in an experience of female fecundity, an experience for which men must seek mercantile compensation. My own analysis of this conflict in fairyland both draws from and diverges from Montrose's. Following Montrose, I read Oberon's struggle with Titania as one among many efforts in the play to intervene in and exert control over an all-female realm. Unlike Montrose, however, I see this realm as steeped in the mercantile rather than separated from it. In more specific terms, what I'm arguing here is that Titania, as much as Oberon, is invested in the Indian boy as a token of exchange. Even in her fecund description of his birth, Titania configures him as a product of global intercourse, one that she claims for her use in her own female economy. Her fairy sor sorority, replicating the rhythms of the early modern domestic unit, readily absorbs the spoils of colonial trade and plunder. Her discord with Oberon stems not so much from her disavowal of the mercantile project, but a desire to partake of it on her own terms. Her willful assertion, the fairyland buys not this child of me, precludes any possibility of exchange, grounded as it is in a desire to possess the exotic rather than trade with it. Oberon's struggle to gain control over the Indian boy is thus also a struggle to regulate this female obsession with foreign merchandise. 
In this respect, the queen of fairies shares much in common with other early modern female consumers who were similarly rebuked for the consumption of newly imported Indian merchandise in medical treatises and household manuals like Markham's. It is only when Oberon is able to cure the hateful imperfection of her eyes that he can curb Titania's longing for monsters and marbles from the East. Thus it is that their fame, debate, or dissension comes to an end, and the play moves swiftly towards its comic resolution. The mortals are united, their progeny is blessed, and natural order is restored. But no such closure is in store for the Indian boy. In the many transactions involving him, he has neither agency nor voice. Till the very end, we are left with a series of questions about his trajectory from east to west. Was he violently stolen from an Indian king, or was he willingly offered up by his Indian votaries? Was he destined to fulfill female appetites, or was he meant to serve as an emblem of male conquest? Was he sought after as a rarity, or was he reviled as a monstrosity? Even in his silence, he speaks volumes about the violence and plunder that went hand in hand with the spice trade. Moving into my final section, I want to offer one last image of spices incarnated as India, this time in a mayoral pageant written by Thomas Middleton in 1622, commissioned by the company of grocers in order to celebrate the inauguration of the new Lord Mayor of London. Much like his earlier mayoral pageants, the triumphs of honor and virtue is a lavish celebration not only of commerce and traffic in the city of London, but also of their colonial potential in more distant lands. Part of a larger tableau in which different figures come into the streets of London to perform exemplary mercantile values, the queen is an opening device in the pageant described as a black personage representing India. She's carried in on a bed of spices by Indians dressed in antique habit. After a speech that inaugurates the pageant, she all but disappears from the scene, presumably merging with the other personages in the procession. Yet she is central to its conceit, a living exemplar of the virtues of commerce and its powers of conversion. She speaks only to testify to the fairness of the English trading in her land. She offers them spices, in turn, they offer her Christianity. Her speech is an interesting study in fair trade agreements, a case of spices for salvation, a bargain made possible by English merchants rather than missionaries. Like Shakespeare's Indian votaries, Middleton's Indian queen is closely tied to the exotic merchandise of her land, particularly to spices. If the votaress is associated with the spiced Indian air, the queen is similarly conjured up in relation to spice plants and trees bearing odor. Unlike Shakespeare's votaress, however, Middleton's queen is granted a voice, but she speaks only to testify to the greatness of the English in her land both evoke the powerful sensory experiences of spice consumption. The Queen's arrival in particular would have been an intensely olfactory experience with commodities like nutmeg, mace, ginger, and cloves liberally strewn among the gathered crowds. As an endorsement of the East India trade, in a celebration of London's civic authorities, the pageant's task is a complex one. It must disassociate India from its early associations with monsters and marvels even while underscoring its distance and difference from everyday life in England. While it cannot afford the absolute immersion in a fantastic world to be found in Shakespeare's construction of India and fairyland, for India had to be rendered immediate, palpable, and viable in the celebration of mercantile achievement, it can conjure up an equally enticing vision of the East and the spice trade. Middleton's Indian Queen becomes precisely the medium through which these contrary objectives are negotiated. The fears of trafficking with heathens and pagans that preoccupied writers of domestic manuals I dealt with in the first section are rendered baseless in this lavish bairn to the glories of commerce, spoken by the very object of these anxieties amidst large crowds of, Lon of boisterous Londoners gathered to witness this spectacle. At the very outset of her speech, the queen begged them to ignore her native dye and view her with her intellectual eye, and I'll quote briefly from this. You that have eyes of judgment and discern, things that the best of man and life concern, draw near, this black is but my native dye, but view me with an intellectual eye. As wise men shoot their beams forth, you'll find a change in the complexion of the mind. I'm beauteous in my blackness, end quote. 
Here, the Indian queen formulates an important conception of race as a native dye, a seemingly innocuous cosmetic pigmentation. Possibly like the dye smeared on the actor playing the Indian queen, her blackness is simply an external attribute, a mere illusion that has more to do with the complexion of the mind than the complexion of the body. Her poignant echo of the Song of Solomon is followed by a more expedient appeal. The Indian queen now convinces her audience that she is no dark heathen or devil-worshipping pagan, but a converted Christian brought to celestial knowledge by none other than the English merchant. What did it matter then if he helped himself to the abundant spices of her land? After all, England sent her more precious plants, the youthful merchants of her land. And here again she says, of gums and fragrant spices, I confess, my climate heaven does with abundance bless, and those you have from me. But what are they compared with the odors whose scents never decay, and those I have from you, plants of your youth? To such celestial knowledge I was led by English merchants first enlightened, end quote. The merchant thus carried knowledge into her dark continent. His profits were meager when compared with her incalculable gains. His blessed commerce had effected a racial and religious transformation. Viewed as such, Middleton's pageant confers the ultimate honor on the English merchantile achievement in the East. For if a change in native dye is possibly irrevocable, a change in the complexion of the mind can wash the Ethiop white. And it is the spice trade that will provide opportunities for precisely such a change and conversion. It is not a mere coincidence that the spectacle of public conversion was sponsored by the Company of Grocers, one of England's earliest commercial corporations, which had in previous centuries been known as the Fraternity of Pepperers. Among other tasks, they were entrusted with the duty of gobbling or preventing the impairment of spices and drugs. Like several other guilds in this period, they stood to make hefty profits from England's spice trade with the East. Thus, the mask ends with a calculated placement of the grocer's coat of arms with that of the noble East India companies, both advertised on a banner and proudly held up by figures in the pageant. As grocers, members of this guild would have been the conduits through which spices purchased overseas by the overseas merchants made their way into the local marketplace. Many of them were also among the founding members of the East India Company. It was naturally in their best interest then to present the East India trade as both materially and spiritually profitable. Middleton's pageant had deftly achieved this task. It had subtly asserted the worth of Indian spices, which the Indian queen, even in her self-effacing manner, had cast as precious, worthy, equal in value to the most precious plants of England. More importantly, it had rendered India knowable. It had brought her into the streets of London. It had affirmed her Christian potential. It had demonstrated her submission to the forces of commerce, adventure, and traffic. In this vision of India, there were neither monsters nor marvels, neither blackamoors nor bantamen, just a fertile female India who gladly preferred the riches of her land. It is with this telling protocolorial vision that I end this saga of spices. The many figures I have invoked along the way monstrous racial hybrids, silent Indian boys, supplicant Indian queens, represent different facets of the East India spice trade. Each embodies fantasies and nightmares of an intercourse with the Indies. Their incarnate forms bear testimony to the ambivalent career of England in the East with all its attendant desires and anxieties. Each points to early days of India that the English palate sampled in their search for the hot stuff. Thank you. Itangeli, thank you so very much. Uh, a saga of spices, um, indeed. So uh, wonderfully uh, fresh and insightful and, and wide ranging from household manuals and, and receipt books, you know, through the plays to the pageants and masks and Lord Mayor shows. Uh, brilliant, uh, brilliant stuff. Um, so yeah, we've got about 20 minutes of questions at the end. Um, do sort of pop them into the box using the, um, the ask a question. Uh, function. Um, yeah, I've, I'll take Chair's privilege. Um, I've got one uh, first. I mean, you've revealed to me that there's, we've got a huge blind spot um, in the project. When it comes to spices, um, we look a little bit at sort of sugar, uh, particularly in relation to, uh, to caffeinated uh, beverages. Um, but sort of spices is, is not something we've really uh, considered. Um, 
Now, I know you, of course, you discuss sort of coffee and sugar um, extensively in um, in tasting difference. Uh, can I just sort of press you a little bit more on what you think sort of the parallels um, with uh, on the sort of the parallels and interaction uh, with these sort of intoxicants more sort of conventionally uh, sort of defined, particularly sort of coffee, but also sugar, uh, sort of sugar and spice, you know, where does, where, 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 where how, with a spice in relation to those basically? Sure, and um, you know, I think you mentioned that uh, I do have this chapter on sugar and uh, in, in that chapter, I'm drawing equally on Thomas Tryon as I'm drawing, for instance, in the chapter on spices. So there is a continuity in the way, for instance, sugar is perceived uh, as an addictive substance, uh, which can transform the body. Uh, and spices are perceived as another kind of substance that can also transform the body. So we're, we are used to thinking of one as addictive, uh, and we're used to thinking of coffee as addictive. Uh, but we we'll think of them as intoxicants or as stimulants because of the transformations we understand that they're affecting on our body. I think yeah. more recent work on this, um, Michael Pollan has um, an interesting new book on coffee, and I, I forget the title, but uh, I do remember that. Is it, is it, is it this one just here? That's it. Absolutely. So lovely that you had it handy. <laughs> Uh, and uh, of course you did, uh, given uh, the focus on intoxicants. But I think I remember him saying that he gave up coffee while he was writing that uh, book, uh, which you can imagine was a challenging kind of experience. But we are, in a sense, used to that sense of the addiction to those substances. We're also more casual in uh, you know, admitting our addiction to, for instance, you will hear colleagues speak about their addiction to coffee over a laptop at Starbucks in the way that you won't hear about uh, you know, other drugs and stimulants. Yes, uh, yes. Spices seem to have shed some of those associations, but you can see how in um, how intimate their uh, their uses are, uh, how pervasive their uses are. Uh, you know, in uh, in rituals, in domestic rituals, in religious rituals, in medicinal rituals, uh, that there is a fear of a kind of uh, addiction in a, in a different way uh, to these substances as well. Um, the responses for coffee vary uh, greatly. I think that also has to do with the ways in which coffee infiltrates uh, the domestic realm. It's so much more in public spaces. It's so much more in coffee houses uh, that the, uh, the blame for such an addiction uh, is, I think, is not quite as gendered against women in the way that uh, you know we see with spices and with sugar to a great extent. Uh, so I think that's where I would point to some of the initial differences. Uh, but uh, in my mind, there is a kind of continuum along which they are being discussed as uh, substances that can uh, very deliberately and very dangerously alter a kind of uh, physiological makeup. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thank you. You've actually just uh, preempted um, another question I was going to ask there. Um... Uh, essentially about the uh, the gendered um, sort of nature of spices. Obviously, you sort of discussed their sort of their effect on the sort of the the, the English humoral body, um, particularly as this sort of alien invader that could sort of permeate its boundaries and um, cause sort of quite alarming physical transformations. I thought they were really sort of interested in interesting parallels with tobacco uh, in that respect. Some of the early sources around tobacco, but, um, but yeah, particularly were they seen as sort of affecting the sort of the, the male and female sort of um, humoral body and sort of psyche sort of differently. Yeah, and um, I, yeah, that's a wonderful example. Although interestingly, when I was looking at, uh, I came across tobacco more often when I was looking at coffee, uh, only in the way that they were often, discussions were often bound together in the same book. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, it's in uh, it's in that way that it comes up. Uh, but um, even with spices, uh, there is a fear of what it will do to the uh, English humoral makeup more generally. Uh, mm -hmm. The concern is not so much that it will transform women alone. The concern seems to be that women are the agents through which it will transform uh, the English humoral makeup. Uh, there's a kind of uh, appetite associated with uh, hoarding and consuming the spices, which often were actually meant for a kind of bilateral trade elsewhere. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, they get hoarded for the English economy. And there's a concern about that, uh, as opposed to just trading with it. Uh, and, uh, you know, that is why it somehow gets centered on women. 
Lovely. Thank you so much, uh, Gitanjali. I, I don't want to sort of mo monopolise you too much. I mean, I've got lots more that I'd like to, to ask. Is the ask a question box working? We've got nothing in there. Um, so if it's not working, I assume it is. It's never it's never failed us before. Um, you can pop something in the uh, in the chat box. Um, so in the meantime, while you're uh, gathering your thoughts, I think what's happened, Gitanjali, is you've blown people's minds. Um, it was so sort of wonderfully wide ranging. Um, yeah. Okay. I've got a um, another thing I sort of wanted to sort of just sort of press you on really it's not uh, really i've not formulated it as a question but i was fascinated um by your discussion of the uh, sort of the magical um sort of properties of sort of spices and their connection with sort of with transformation uh, and with fairies and one of my sort of side interests when i'm sort of not doing intoxicants is sort of his early modern um sort of witchcraft so i wonder if you can sort of say a little bit more um about these sort of these these sort of magical associations yeah. It's interesting, but I think almost inevitable that you bring that up, uh, because I think maybe even when I was reading some of the recipes out loud, you could see how easily they could uh, they could be from Macbeth witches, for instance. Uh, if you look at you know their chants, if you look at their incantations, they take the form of a recipe. Uh, and uh, if you read Hannah Woolley, uh, it takes that similar kind of form. I mean, the recipe I discussed uh, about using pepper in the eyes to cure blindness, uh, that is a sort of magical potion here. What is interesting to me is, you know, of course, Shakespeare's witches have that sense of uh, brewing and, uh, you know, um, stirring the pot and, you know, the incantation that uh, comes with it. Uh, but the language of that is is replicating the language of these recipe collections as well. So there yeah. is a sense that uh, there is a power, um, whether we want to call it magical, whether we want to call it medicinal, whether we want to call it culinary, uh, there is a sense in which uh, these witchcraft-like practices are seen to effect a transformation in the household. Uh, yes. And I referred to some other substances, uh, you know, that one spices, but spices were often mixed with them. You know, I talked about umbilical cords. Uh, I talked about uh, blood, breast milk, uh, you know, rat's blood sometimes. Uh, these are for fairly innocuous uh, treatments, you know, like to make the hair fair or something. Uh, so, uh, you, or, you know, to cure bedwetting among children. Uh, so there is a sense that what is being achieved in the kitchen is magical. It is transformative as much as maybe there is a sense that Shakespeare's witches are able to effect that kind of transformation in a whole different proportion. Yes, yeah, brilliant. And obviously sort of herbs have been sort of looked at in, in sort of in that context before, but I think yes, spices um, sort of there again have been sort of hitherto um, yeah. a little bit a little bit overlooked. Um, there's still there's still not a question. I don't believe this. This is this is a this is a first in the series. I'll just assume that everyone's sort of very um tugs. Of course it is. It's 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 nine o'clock in in San Francisco. Um it's sort of it's five o'clock here, so maybe people have had a, a sort of a busy day uh, sort of teaching um, and, their, and their minds are, are a little bit tried. Um but I've I mean I've got another one. I could sort of keep on going um, right to the top of the hour. Um I won't. Um we'll we'll sort of let you go early <laughs> if no one else wants to ask something. But yeah, obviously I'll just take it as some as you know, people being quite hungry for dinner after a discussion of spices. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're all they're all rushing to their they're all rushing to their spice cupboards as we uh, as, as as we speak. Um uh, but yeah, obviously, sort of the talk was very much sort of in um, the realm of um, sort of you know, sort of representations or sort of discussions, texts. Um, if we sort of wanted to um, sort of get a handle on sort of the, the volumes of spices um, that were sort of being imported, obviously it's not sort of your concern in this talk or sort of in the book. Um, but is there any sort of work on sort of the imports of spices that you could sort of suggest or any particular sources that you think might be um, sort of useful if we were sort of trying to, to, to sort of reconstruct or get a sense of the volumes that were actually uh, coming in? I think that, you know, the um, most of the sources are sources on the East India Company itself. Uh, you know, I think there were early historians like R.C. Prasad who wrote about uh, the uh, the... Uh, you know, who was carrying what, uh, often replicating uh, verbatim uh, diaries kept by merchants, by factors, uh, by East India Company uh, emissaries, uh, you know, in in 
what we now call the Indian subcontinent. So I think there are more details about volume, about price, uh, and uh, about you know where they were intended to go. There are also many details about a point in time when the English had to stop trading in spices uh, because of the you know uh, the rivalries with the Dutch on the Spice Islands, and then how cloth becomes the focus of this kind of trade as well. Uh, so those sort of you know uh, details emerge effectively in that literature. Uh, but um, in you know in the recipe books we see some of that in Woolly you know her concern with how does it come here is it as effective as it gets here we also see some concerns with quantities uh, you can see you know a spoonful of versus a penny worth of uh, so you can see how you know what the price is at some points of time and what uh, uh, you know maybe at some point you don't refer to prices and then it becomes a handful so it's possible that they're getting more affordable by then as well. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and you know, we, we do have a question. We just have a, um, a, a comment from um, uh, Katerina Leto. She said, it was wonderful to travel along Spices in this great lecture. She's so blown away in a good way by the information that she can't state a question uh, in this moment. And I think that probably goes for everyone who's been out there listening, because it was just mind-blowingly good. Um, we do have a question from Bethan uh, Davis, uh, who, if I'm not mistaken, Bethan is actually working um, on representations of sugar in Shakespeare, I think. I might have got that wrong. Um, she says, thank you for such a fascinating talk. Uh, just thinking about receipt books, uh, how do you approach the methodological question of whether English housewives are making the recipes using these ingredients um, and sort of reading the recipe books or whether they function more as aspirational texts? Thank you for that question. And uh, I think in the whole uh, range that I covered very briefly in uh, 40 minutes maybe, uh, I didn't have a chance to address some of these issues. Uh, but yes, I, I think that, you know, uh, some of the ones I was referring to, like uh, Mistress Sarah Long, we're seeing in manuscript form. So there is a way in which uh, their use is being recorded as possibly they're being used in the kitchen. There's a way in which the, the handwritten form represents that. When we come to later printed collections like Hannah Woolley's, uh, there is a way in which it is it is reaching a larger audience and with a sense that it's an aspirational audience. Uh, but I would think that the repeated publications and re, uh, the you know the popularity that Hannah Woolley gained during that time would suggest that there was an interest uh, in in the heuristic aspect of it in actually you know using these recipes uh, even uh, as it was an aspirational uh, aspect. I also want to say that. You know, we, we've seen spices in the medieval period as well. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, re references and uses for spices well before the period I'm talking about. But I think it, this period, we see this interesting shift and in all of these concerns in many ways because they are more accessible to uh, a, a different population, more widely accessible uh, to uh, the domestic unit. And I think that's why we see some of these controversies in the domestic manuals as well. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, uh, Bethany. Yes, glad to see in the comments that I got your, your topic right. Great. Um, uh, Lucas, Lucas Richard. Hi, Ruth. Luke, he has uh, another question that's quite a broad one. Uh, he asks, can you say a bit more about the use and blending of spices into medical products such as infusions, tonics and tinctures? Uh, and what do these various processes look like? Yeah, I think they are. Um, it's sometimes so hard to distinguish between what is a medicinal procedure and what is a culinary procedure. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, because both are sort of uh, consumed orally uh, in that sense. Uh, but they range. Uh, and I think the question is about the uses to which they're put. Right. Uh, it, it it ranges, I think, from things like, uh, you know, to cure colic uh, as I, so to cure blindness. Uh, to uh, for children who are prone to bedwetting, that one comes up a lot. Uh, for instance, uh, there are some which are broadly speaking tonics uh, and waters, more generally referred to, uh, which. Um, their uses for specific ailments aren't outlined, uh, but the sense in which they're referred to as, you know, this uh, a water for a plague or, uh, you know, how to make so-and-so's water and there's a name that follows there. There's a sense in which they're widely used and sort of commonly stored in the household for all possible ailments uh, that might come up. 
Uh, so there's quite the range there. And I can't always speak to their efficacy. I wonder about, uh, you know, the blindness one, especially how does it cure blindness? I wonder about the contraceptual ones as well. You know, how uh, how is that efficacy being assessed? Uh, what, you know, medicinal uses is it being put to in that way? Uh, but it seems like it comes up often enough where there is a sense that there are medicinal properties associated with it. Brilliant, thank you uh, for that, Luke. And Ian Smith, again, sort of touching on the sort of question of intoxication again, he says, how many of these substances would we now view as psychoactive? Probably yeah, not I, all that many. I, uh, I, I, it's interesting how that, um, how we've sort of made that distinction. We don't have that kind of concern about spices. I mean, of course, uh, there's always the sense of heart and curry and those associations linger uh, with India uh, in all kinds of ways. Uh, but uh, the, the, we don't worry as much about the transformation they can affect on the body in the way that we worry about sugar. Uh, I you know, often talk with my students about this, that how many connotations do we actually see of the word sweet that remain positive anymore? You know, sweet comes to be associated with cloying. Sweet comes to be associated with, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a sense of dangerous. Even sugar has uh, those connotations for us, for our diet. Uh, spices don't seem to get uh, that much attention. Uh, and, you know, in fact, we hear more about their curative properties. Coffee is one that I think doesn't get as much of a bad rap as it could, uh, maybe because we're so immersed in the addiction to it uh, that we're not really taking note of the very genuine uh, transformations it does uh, create on the body in the way that Michael Bolan uh, discusses extensively. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, so um, we, we now have a little rush on questions. There's time for one more, um, I think, as we like to keep it to a tight 60, as we call it. Uh, and this is from uh, Sarah Pennell. Hi, Sarah. Um, she says, uh, Thomas Tryon is an interesting chap. He was a vegetarian beemanist, uh, probably mispronouncing that, and yet also prided himself on becoming a merchant, and he was, of course, a dealer in sugar. Um, and, of course, another one of his books is The Merchant, Cit uh, Citizen and Countryman's Instructor. And so I was wondering if there's perhaps a different interpretation uh, of the passage that you quoted. Uh, I haven't seen uh, interpretations of this particular passage, but I do see a very different interpretation and I offer a very different interpretation of what Tryon discusses in relation to sugar. Uh, there is a way in which with regard to spices, he seems to be laying the blame quite squarely on the appetitive nature of uh, you know, women's use of spices. When it comes to sugar, it, it's it's almost like you know Tryon develops a, a, a strange new conscience there, uh, because I, and I think you know uh, if I mean I think Sarah Pennell's work has dealt with this as well. If I mistake not, uh, there is uh, you know so much that he writes about the colonial economies uh, associated with sugar and how in feeding off sugar, uh, the English are feeding off that economy. He writes about uh, this in uh, the transatlantic slave trade uh, and how, uh, you know, our addictions are in fact feeding that. Uh, so there's a way in which we see that transformation uh, over a period of time. Uh, and yeah, his vegetarianism, I think, needs a chapter by itself, which I okay, won't get into. <laughs> you have a time. Right, so, uh, one more. Uh, one last question from uh, from Lucy. Thanks, Lucy, about the um, the differences between um, sort of the different spices, which obviously we're not going to be able to sort of answer in full. But is there just perhaps a, a, some, something sort of very quick that you'd like to sort of say on that, Katanjali, before we wrap things up? I think it's pepper, pepper all the way. Some of the others, uh, mace, uh, uh, you know, sort of infrequently or not imported on the same scale, but pepper seems to be predominant in all of these. Hey, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So we are um, almost at the witching hour, um, but it reminds me to say uh, thanks uh, to you for coming. And in particular, uh, thank you so much for, uh, to Git Angeli uh, for kicking off our third season uh, in such fine uh, and spicy uh, style. It really was great. And I must finally just compliment you on your, your wonderful background. <laughs> um, which is sort of so appropriate to the, uh, to the talk and the, the project. It really is lovely. Um, so we've actually got a little bit of a hiatus now. It's just how the cookie crumbled in terms of scheduling. Um, but we'll be back uh, in just under a month uh, on the 27th of October with our next talk, which is from our own Hannah Hodax and Anna Knutson. Um, and it's on uh, coffee cultures in 18th century Sweden. 
Um, and at the bottom, um, I've just popped up a link uh, to the rest of the seminar schedule where you can book on uh, for that uh, and all uh, subsequent talks. Um, so we'll see you, uh, yeah, in just under a, a month, hopefully. But yeah, thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Gitanjali. That really was uh, fantastic. And uh, yeah, take care, everyone. See you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.